Today I want to break it down with the good doctor, one Stephen Emmanuel Strange the third, aka the Rumble. I was nervous before the movie's release, and my fears were only half justified. Roughly the first third of the movie works great. I've been rereading some Silver Age Doctor Strange, and this movie does a solid job adapting those early stories. I don't need an adaptation to be super faithful. If an adaptation makes some changes, that's fine, provided the changes improve on what is being changed. But if the changes are are not an improvement, the Doctor Strange movie is frustrating because in some ways it is extremely faithful to his origin. Strange as an egotist who gets in a car accident and seeks out magic as a way to heal himself, that comes right off the page. Most of the time, I don't care about the books, and my suggested fixes likely fly even more in the face of the books, since I only care about ways the movie could have been better. But since I am familiar with this source material, I think if the movie had stuck to the comics a little closer, it would have improved the movie. In the comics, Strange goes to the Ancient One to heal his hand so he can return to being a surgeon. He's stranded at the Ancient One's home because of a snowstorm and finds out Mordo is planning to kill the Ancient One. When Strange tries to intervene, Mordo casts a spell, preventing him from telling the Ancient One about Mordo's scheme. But Strange can still talk about other stuff, so he offers to become a student of the Ancient One. The Ancient One reveals he already knew what Mordo was up to, but keep your friends close and your enemies closer. In the movie, once Strange is accepted as a student of the Ancient One, she and Mordo start training him to be a warrior without telling him that's what they're doing. Less than a second after he finds out, an explosion thrusts him into a fight, and afterwards, everyone yells at him for not wanting to do this, even though they seemed okay with Benjamin Bratt getting what he needed from his magic studies and going back to his old life. The movie takes advantage of the narrative tool of the character's wants versus their needs. Strange wants his hands healed so he can go back to his old life, but the Ancient One believes his need is to become a mystic warrior to protect the planet. This is a solid method of storytelling but I feel like Steven loses agency in between finding out the wizards are warriors and the Ancient One's death. Circumstances out of his control force him to fight Caecilius, but it seems like he's acting on instinct, not making an active choice to become involved in this life Mordo and the Ancient One were telling him about earlier. When the Ancient One is dying, it doesn't feel like it's Steven's choice to follow in her footsteps. The Ancient One is like a parent, encouraging their child what to do. The kid thinks they're thinking for themselves, but really they're just doing what Mommy said to do. In the comics, the Ancient One almost certainly summoned a snowstorm to strand Steven. <laughs> Alliteration. While the Ancient One is gently nudging Steven toward conditions where he is more likely to become his disciple, he did not force Steven to make the choice to help him. It's a fine line, and I'm probably the only one who has a problem with the way it's executed in the movie. It certainly doesn't help that the Ancient One can see the future, but claims she doesn't know what lies in Steven's future, even though in Infinity War, she knows he will be her student in a few short years. Here's what I would do. Cut the scene at the beginning with the Ancient One fighting Caecilius. Other than that, everything's the same until Strange gets to Kamartage. In Act 1, we strike a balancing act, showing Strange is an arrogant son of a gun, but he can still act heroic. That scene where they extract the bullet from the guy does this pretty well. The Ancient One shows him the weird Ditko mind trip, and Strange somehow overhears an ominous voice mentioning that he will soon have the Ancient One removed, at the hands of someone close to her, and then he can make his move. Like in the movie, Strange isn't sure he believes in any of this, but he does believe the Ancient One's life is in danger. He tries to warn her, she brushes it off, he says, forget about healing my hands. I've just been through a spiritual experience. I want to study here. She doesn't buy it, but she accepts, and she tells Mordo he won't last a week. And maybe she's right. As far as Steven is concerned, he just wants to stop an attempted murder, then go back to finding a way to fix his hands. After the bullet extraction scene, this further shows there is a hint of selfless heroism in him. This is a small nitpick, but I'm torn on how Mordo convinces the Ancient One to let Steven study there. I like the irony of the future bad guy helping the future good guy on his way to becoming the future future good guy, but again, in Infinity War, the Ancient One seems very certain Steven is on his way here, so I don't know why she kicked him out in Kamartage. Speaking of Mordo, I'm cutting Caecilius from the movie. Not that he's a bad character, but he's comic book Baron Mordo, former disciple of the Ancient One who later forms an alliance with Dormammu which backfires on him. That's Mordo. Caecilius in the comics was just some guy who worked for Mordo for a few issues. He briefly shows up in the early 1980s just long enough to get a name, then disappeared for another 35 years, and was brought back only because the movie reminded everyone he existed. Removing Caecilius allows us to take his more Baron Mordonian characteristics and transplant them back onto Baron Mordo where they belong. But I don't want Mordo to be the bad guy, at least not yet. I hated the setup for Mordo as an antagonist. You don't like when two sorcerers break the rules, so now you're going to cripple a guy who had nothing to do with them breaking the rules? Okay, idiot. This might be worse than Sinestro putting on the fear ring for no reason in the Green Lantern movie. The problem is, the movie portrays Mordo as a pretty nice guy 
guy. He saves Steven, intercedes on his behalf, helps him save the world. It comes out of nowhere when the Stinger gives us a, yeah, he's a bad guy, you like that, don't you? The Ancient One says Mordo's soul is rigid and unmovable, which I guess is foreshadowing, but like I said, it doesn't work for me. This would be really difficult, but I'd want to show that Mordo is a devoted student of the Ancient One, but is also capable of becoming the eternal enemy of Doctor Strange in later movies. Let's reuse that old chestnut of we're not so different, you and I, and say Mordo's character flaw matches Strange's. They're both arrogant. Mordo thinks he's already humbled himself by joining the Ancient One, but deep down, he questions a lot of her commands, thinking he knows better. And he's got a good reason to question her wisdom, because the Good Baron is slowly dying of cancer, which is a thing from the 1990s comics. This further parallels Steven, who also had a physical affliction that brought him to the Ancient One. Why doesn't the Ancient One cure this poor man's agonizing disease? Either A, she can't. Any use of magic comes with a cost, which makes sense. Otherwise, these sorcerers could wipe out every disease known and unknown to man in an afternoon. If she cures his cancer, something worse will manifest itself, either in Mordo or in herself, and she cannot allow that. Or, if you want to get nasty, maybe the Ancient One isn't exactly a nice lady. She's here to protect this plane of existence, and sometimes that means using and abusing one person for the greater good. She can keep Mordo healthy, but not quite cured, to keep him in her service, because one day she might need him to fend off a demon invasion. When she allowed Benjamin Bratt to cure his broken spine, he left because he didn't need her anymore. And if she lets every student cure their problems, she's going to have a hard time defending Earth by herself. She knows Benjamin Bratt is free advertising, and his word of mouth will bring other sad sacks to her doorstep, but she can't do that with every student that comes her way. She's not evil, she's just looking at the big picture, which is apt since she tells Steven he could go back to saving maybe a hundred people a year with his surgery skills, or he could save millions of people behind the scenes as the Sorcerer Supreme, which would mean his ego would take a hit since nobody would know he's saving them, which by this point is probably a non-issue for Steven, but it shows the audience how far he's come. If the Ancient One was given the trolley problem, she wouldn't hesitate to flip the switch so one innocent dies if it means saving the other five. It's messed up, but it makes for an interesting character, one we almost had with Strange in Infinity War. Remember his conversation with Tony? Would have been nice if the movie followed through with that. Maybe someday I'll do a video on that, no promises though. So if we don't have Cassilius and Mordo isn't a bad guy yet, and the Ancient One is only morally gray, very, very gray, but still gray, what does that leave us with? Dormammu is our big antagonist, but I'd still hold his face reveal till the climax. In lieu of battles in the mirror dimension, I'd hold off on the physical conflict till the end and spend most of the movie with character interactions between our heroes, with Steven secretly investigating who might be trying to kill the Ancient One. You can still do big action stuff in the climax, but in the middle of the movie, that's where we can see Strange use his mind. And you can pepper a lot of weird otherworldly visions in the middle during his investigation. You could also show the different sanctums around the world, say there's different scrolls and teachings kept safe at each one, as well as other magical weapons and artifacts. We can't keep all of that in one spot, it would be too dangerous. Since we're spending a lot of time at Kamartage, I'd want to beef up our supporting cast with minor characters from the comics. Kalu, Victoria Bentley, and Sarah Wolf. This would be necessary since I'm making Strange a detective and you need suspects in a mystery story. These characters wouldn't need an expensive character art, but they would need to be more than the red shirts we see in the movie. The implication is that all of the Ancient One students have something they want the Ancient One to fix. Might not be physical ailments, but something that plagues them. In the comics, Kalu is pretty power hungry, so maybe the line Mordo had in the movie about seeking help from the Ancient One to defeat his enemies, that's Kalu in this fix. Maybe Victoria Bentley struggles with feeling inadequate compared to her father, so she came to Kamartage to make her own path. Sarah, maybe she comes from a scientific background like Steven, and isn't sure she can balance these two distinct worldviews in her brain, so she's studying more for her own peace of mind. Sarah is kind of difficult since in the comics she didn't have magic powers, but whatever. We would still have Wong in the movie, and Steven suspects him as well, at least at first. There could be a fun bit where Steven realizes everyone here wants something, so he just point blank asks Wong what he wants, and he says, I like books, so I'm the bookkeeper. I'm not sure how you would show this on screen, but as Steven gets further into his investigation, he sees something in each of his fellow students that reflects one of his own negative character traits, and he realizes he doesn't like what he sees. I don't know how you would do that without spelling it out, but it would be neat, I think. When Steven isn't investigating potential murderers, he'll be studying how to perform spells, and Mordo will fill him in on some of the Ancient One's previous victories in protecting this realm. When the time comes, she will choose one of her students to replace her as the next Sorcerer Supreme. Steven says he isn't interested in being a warrior, and once his hands are healed, he'll go back to being a healer. This will kind of be like the scene in the movie after Steven kills Cassilius' henchman, but less argumentative. The movie tries to portray Steven as being wrong, as the Ancient One can tell when Strange is BSing her, and Mordo calls him a coward for not
not wanting to murder people. But I find it interesting that when Strange was a jackbutt, that's when he swore to do no harm. But when he becomes a better person, that's when he may have to kill a few dudes. Most of the time, when a character starts off in a negative place and goes on a journey of growth, you don't see them add murder to their repertoire. I just wish the movie played with this a little bit instead of immediately jumping to, nah, Steven's a coward. In addition to the more internal development of our protagonist, we would also have the external plot of Dormammu trying to influence the Ancient One students. In the comics, while Dormammu is an adversary of Doctor Strange, he is the protector of his own realm. In Strange Tales 127, Strange battles him and would have lost, except Dormammu used up a lot of his own power he used to keep the mindless ones from invading his dimension. Strange gives Dormammu a boost, and Dormammu reluctantly says, since you saved my realm, I won't attack yours. It wasn't much, but it made Dormammu feel like more than a one-dimensional villain to a young comics teen 2099. That ethical code felt like it was missing in the movie. When Strange says he'll release Dormammu from the time trap only if Dormammu stops attacking Earth, I didn't see any reason why Dormammu should stick to his word. Sure, he didn't have any reason in the comics, but since he was the one who swore to Steven in the first place, I felt like he wouldn't have any reason to lie. While in the movie, Steven is the one who brings up the pact. Again, another fine line I don't think anyone had any issues with, but I did because this makes Dormammu less interesting. If you think about it, Dormammu is to his dimension what the Ancient One is to ours, willing to protect his own people at any cost, which makes him look like a bad guy to us since we are not his people and thus much more likely to be in the way of his goal. If you want to keep the idea that sorcerers can glean the future, a long time ago, Dormammu saw the era of superheroes the MCU is now entering, and he said, that looks like it could be trouble for my realm. So centuries ago, Dormammu invaded our dimension, probably killed lots of people as a preemptive strike before the ever-increasing superhumans could attack his dimension. The Ancient One fought back, which we will tie in with her drawing power from the Dark Dimension. It's preferable for plot to come from characters making decisions, instead of it just happening. She does this so she's better equipped to protect her world, but also it weakens Dormammu, so he's less likely to attack again. There are texts in one of the sanctums about this kind of magic, and the Ancient One forbids her more adumbral students from pursuing them, since they might screw it up and open a giant portal between worlds, or worse, they might get it right and they would have no need of her, all their problems would be over. So Dormammu's getting old, and I'm getting older too, and he wants to find someone to either willingly replace him as the protector of his realm, which means they would probably never get to leave, or, failing that, suck out all their magic juice so that he can more effectively protect his people. You might think the Ancient One or Dormammu could come to some sort of agreement. You stop siphoning power from my dimension, I don't attack you again, you let me recruit Mordo to be my heir, and we can kind of watch each other's backs. But that won't work for her, because she is also getting older, and I'm still getting older too, and she needs all hands on deck to protect this reality in case something else, maybe not Dormammu, but something big and nasty comes to destroy this realm. Dormammu might be taking the second most powerful sorcerer on this planet to protect his people, and whenever the Ancient One taps out, that leaves Earth unprotected. So Dormammu resorts to subterfuge via magic telepathy to try to remove his ancient foe, and find a new pupil to protect his own realm while he's at it. And his whisperings aren't just about killing the Ancient One. Maybe he tells Victoria, your dad misses you, you should leave this life and return to him. Kalu, you're strong enough, you could start your own school, this is all beneath you. If a student isn't right for assassination or coming to the dark side, at the very least he can remove them as potential threats down the line. And because Steven has convinced himself he isn't taking this sorcery thing too seriously, and is only killing time while he tries to find the would-be assassin, Dormammu will underestimate him. Since Kalu is a bad guy in the comics, eventually he will succumb to Dormammu's siren song and attack the Ancient One. The forbidden texts he's after are in the New York Sanctum. He makes his way there, injuring Wong as he does so, and killing the master of the New York Sanctum. If you're gonna use Daniel Drum, that's fine, but then it probably got all three Baron Voodoo fans' hopes up, thinking you were setting up Baron Voodoo's appearance down the line. And if you're not doing that, maybe don't use Daniel Drum here. I don't know. Kalu goes to become Dormammu's new pupil, thinking there's more room for career advancement there than as the Ancient One student. The Ancient One has a staff meeting where she confesses to drawing power from the Dark Dimension, and now charges her students to do whatever they must to stop Dormammu from making this dimension his summer home. This is where Mordo's worldview crashes. She told me this Dark Dimension stuff was dangerous, and not only was she imbibing on the side, but she probably could have healed my cancer a long time ago? Heck no, I'm out of here. Victoria is still crippled with her inferiority complex, so she doesn't feel up to going to war with a demon that the Ancient One herself had trouble defeating. So it's down to Sarah and Steven. Sarah says someone should stay behind in case the other one fails in stopping Dormammu's attack, then at least one can try to defend Karmartaj. Steven volunteers Sarah to stay behind. He knows she and Wong are pretty close, and hopefully, if the movie plays its cards right, by now we can believe that maybe he will have a chance against Dormammu, even though he is the newest student at Karmartaj. Steven goes alone, taking the Ancient One's old cloak and amulet. If you're going to be the interim Sorcerer Supreme, you gotta look the part. Although the 
Ikshuan is no longer alive to draw energy from Dormammu, he is still in a weakened state after hundreds of years of losing power. So Steven will mostly be fighting against Kalu. It's just about a draw, so Steven manages to convince Kalu working for Dormammu is not a good idea. Kalu tries to use the same technique he used to open the gateway from Earth to Dormammu's world once again to effect a swift retreat, but it backfires and he accidentally opens a portal to another dimension, one even more terrifying than Dormammu's. The mindless ones are a coming, and Dormammu turns his attention from the two Earthlings, and Kalu tries to make his getaway, but finds the entry back to Earth is blocked, probably by Dormammu earlier, as he anticipated Kalu might try to double-cross him. Dormammu is in no shape to fend off an entire invasion, so Steven uses his own magic to close up the portal while Dormammu fends off the mindless ones that made it in. Much like in Strange Tales 127, Dormammu feels indebted to Strange, and maybe also he's a little afraid of a novice who is able to so easily patch up a hole between dimensions like that, so he's not sure if he's ready to go to war with Earth just yet, at least while he's in this state. So even though Strange is not happy with Dormammu's part in the Ancient One's death, he strikes a bargain with Dormammu. Mind your P's and Q's, and you won't have any trouble from me and mine. Dormammu agrees, provided he is allowed to keep Kalu, whether he wants to stay or not, and the text he stole from the Ancient One. Dormammu probably wants to pick through Kalu's brain and learn everything he can about how the Ancient One trained her other protégés, and in the event that Strange falls in the line of duty, he wants to know what other threats might come from Earth. Strange agrees with a counter provision. If you get a hostage, we should probably also have an ambassador from your realm as a guest at Kamartaj. Dormammu sees the terms as fair and says he will send along someone shortly, and Steven returns home. So Steven has now left his fellow student to be mentally tormented till the end of time, and has made an alliance with the demon who pushed Kalu to kill the Ancient One. This echoes the Ancient One's modus operandi of being a little harsh in service of protecting her territory. Steven asked the Ancient One to teach him, and she did, but not the lessons he thought he would learn. His allies back home might not approve of him wheeling and dealing with the entity responsible for the Ancient One's death, but he brought peace, which is the job of the Sorcerer Supreme. But he doesn't feel great about what he's done, and on his return, he tries to return the Ancient One's cloak and amulet, but Sarah and Wong both agree that they belong to him now. He got his hands dirty, but he saved the planet, and if Steven thinks he's not ready for this yet, that may be true, but he is the best Sorcerer Supreme we've got right now. Steven reluctantly agrees, and says Kamartaj was the Ancient One's seat of power. With the New York Sanctum now empty, there will need to be a master to keep watch there. He will continue his studies at the New York Sanctum, feeling he is a long way from being the expert the Ancient One was. Wong will be the go-between, helping Sarah rebuild Kamartaj's student population and training new sorcerers they may need in the future, and helping Steven continue his studies at the New York Sanctum. With the neat little portal doors, this wouldn't be difficult for him. And that basically takes us to where the movie ended. Very little for Christine here, which is fine because she didn't have much to do in the movie either. As far as the stinger, I actually hate it when it's just an abbreviated scene from an upcoming movie that just seems lazy to me. So instead, we see the hostage slash ambassador from Dormammu's dimension. None other than... Dormammu's niece, Clea. Yes, she was introduced in Multiverse of Madness, but I think we can work her introduction in a little earlier. Something kind of like the ending of the last Airbender movie. Dormammu says, hey, keep an eye on that Sorcerer Supreme, and she'll say, yes, uncle. This might make her seem like a bad guy, which she really isn't, but in the comics, she just seems very dainty, at least in her early appearances. I would want her to be a little tough, someone you could buy Steven one day falling in love with, instead of this little wallflower. Closing credits, the Doors People Are Strange plays, because if Iron Man can get Iron Man by Black Sabbath, we should get something cool for Doctor Strange. Or, failing that, Strange Magic by ELO. I actually like People Are Strange better, but Strange Magic is probably more thematically appropriate. And that's it. I know most people seem to like Strange's first movie, but like I said, a lot of it didn't really work for me. This, even though it's a little light on details, is one of my longer videos, so hopefully you guys liked it. I don't know what's next, but whatever it is, whenever it gets here, I hope you enjoy it. Until then, chew on this one again. See you next time.